Hey everyone, welcome. Uh, I am Keith Giles. Uh, super excited to have our very first episode of. Uh, I guess it's a podcast. It's sort of not a podcast. It's a it's a Zoom cast or something. Anyway, um, but uh, the first episode of what we're calling Imaginary Lines, and uh, this will be a podcast where we will talk about uh, art, film, poetry, literature, um, probably comics and. Who knows what else uh, comes up? And uh, I'm joined by my good friend, uh, Daryl Epp. So Daryl, introduce yourself a little bit, let people know a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm Daryl Epp. I live in Hamilton, Ontario. And uh, my fourth book was recently published. It's called Mechanical Monkeys. And there it is. <laughs> yeah. And um I don't know what else there is to say about myself, but basically with this podcast, um, we're talking about things that we like, things that we think are important, and hopefully we can sort of tap the, dis the discourse a bit in the, in the direction away from uh, commercial uh, uh, cold calculations and more to um, things that point towards the transcendent. And I think time spent admiring art is um, always healthy because it uh, tickles this yearning that we all have for uh, transcendent things. Mm. So I think that's uh, something very uh, worth doing. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And I've wanted to do something like this for such a long time, uh, Daryl, and, and I, I was, I think originally thinking of doing it by myself, but then the other day you and I, did a, a little thing like this where we talked about uh, your newest book and it was such a wonderful time. And I thought, man, we should do this more often. Maybe this is what we should be doing and uh, what I should be doing this on this sort of theme. And you were like, let's do it. So why not? Uh, and I'll just say briefly, the, the imaginary lines kind of just, the title just kind of came to me. I guess I was thinking first about how I'm in, I'm in uh, the United States, Daryl, you are in Canada. And even though you know, we're separated by this imaginary line of a border on a map. Um, I, I feel that you and I have such similar tastes and, and background and experiences. And um, so it is, it is an imaginary line, right? It's a line, but it isn't really real in some ways. But there's also that idea of imaginary line being something about you. Know, it's, cre it's imagination, it's creativity. Um, anytime you write anything fictional, uh, you're describing something that's that's not really real in some sense, but in other ways it can be more real than reality. So not to get too deep on it, but I just thought it was a great uh, name for the podcast and hopefully it captures a little bit of what we're going to be discussing in each episode. And in some ways it's wide open and we, Daryl and I kind of know what we want to talk about, but it, we really don't know where we're going to end up. And that's one of the things I love about uh, these kinds of conversations. So so yeah, uh, yeah, um, that's a good title, and 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 the funny thing is, you know, when um, uh, I remember the German artist Gottfried Hellenwein, he said the job of the artist is not to grow up, and basically um, the big thing an artist has to worry about is living in the real world without winding up in a loony bin, but. <laughs> still fighting to maintain the sense of play that every child has. Yeah. And um, when you grow up and go to the real world, if you say that's just imaginary, that's an insult, mm -hmm. right? When it's funny, like where, where would, would we be without someone daydreaming about, oh, maybe I'll build a bridge. And then this bridge becomes a reality if you can drive over a bridge, right? Yes. And of course, you know, what science is now telling us um, according to the latest research about the way, um, you know, the observer and consciousness interacts with, uh, with the physical world. Um, what if the physical world is the one that's more, uh, more ephemeral, mm -hmm. you know, where there are a lot of hard scientists saying, um, you know, the physical world is activated by the act of being observed. Yes. So, so this whole thing about I live in the real world and you're living in this daydream world, you know, um, it's actually really uh, 
a, a corny and a false division, you know? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you know what? Um, I'm writing down something because you just touched on something that I want to, in a future episode, I'd like for us to discuss, um, which is sort of like a, the idea of inspiration and where our ideas come from, where inspiration comes from. So um, I'm going to write that down for a future reference because that'll be a, that'll be a blast. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, great, great. Yeah. So we're, how should we start off? I uh, I had a little thing I wanted to do and you had a couple things you wanted to to cover. What sh Should I do mine first and get it out of the way and then we can jump into your uh, your poems? Yeah, sounds great. Okay. So uh, this won't take long. I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, this film that I just saw last week. And it's one, it's by one of my favorite filmmakers. His name is David Lowry. Um, he's a young filmmaker. He's only directed a couple of films uh, to this point. Um, I first came across him. He directed a film which came out, I believe, like two and a half, maybe three years ago. It's called A Ghost Story. And it is probably one of my all-time favorite films, really. I mean, that movie uh, is so beautiful. And, and check it out. I highly, highly recommend that movie. It's about grief and loss and love and the afterlife and uh, but it's so beautiful and so well done. And, and so I love, love, love that movie. And so when I saw that his next film coming out was this a film called The Green Knight and I saw the trailers for it, which were just phenomenal. I mean, the trailers, you know, isn't this the way it is? The trailers are always amazing. I, I, I think I should just watch trailers because most of the time the trailer is way better. It's like 10 times better than the actual. Yeah. Um, as as the Star Wars, the most recent Star Wars films are <laughs> like you just watch the trailer. You're 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 going to get everything you need out of the trailer. Trust me, the actual film will not come close to that. Anyway, um, so the trailers for the you know the Green Knight is based on a um, an Arthurian legend. You know an Arthurian sort of a folk tale uh, called the Green Knight, and um, it's. I mean, I vaguely remember the actual story. I think it's pretty close. I mean, it's pretty faithful. To the actual story, um, do you know the story, Daryl? Like, can you could you summarize briefly what the Green Knight's about? What happens? What is that? What is it all about? Well, um, if I recall, um, it's basically a story where we find out um, why knights wore that uh, sash because uh, Sir Gawain um, was at a party with uh, with uh, King Arthur and was basically challenged to a very strange kind of contest. And he went on this year long journey to prove his virtue and came back successful. And at the end, all the knights of the round table basically held him up as a model of uh, virtue and courage. So um, they wore this sash in honor of him from then on. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. And the part about the sash isn't really the main part of the of, of the film, but the general sense of it is that test. There's sort of this challenge that's given. The Green Knight shows up, and um, and he's this weird, like supernatural kind of a character. Yeah. He's super huge, and he's covered in moss and vines and stuff, and he doesn't even look human. And and he has this strange challenge, like you know, I'll let you strike a blow against me, and a year from now, um, to the day. Uh, I get to return the same that you give to me. And uh, so Sir Gawain basically cuts his head off and it rolls to the floor. And then the guy picks up his head and right. then he talks and says, okay, see you next year. See you next year. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so then, the, so then the, the quest is basically the guy is marching to his ultimate doom because of it. So it's a, it's a, it's a very fascinating, I mean, just in its, in the kernel of the story, there's a great interesting story there. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, there's this sort of sense of like, uh, you have this sense in the film. I mean, let me talk now about the film. In, in the film, you have this sense that Gowan is young. He hasn't proven himself yet. He's in the room with all the other knights, you know, and Galahad and Lancelot and all these, you know, wonderful, amazing, you know, he looks up to these guys and he has no story to tell. That's kind of the, the big thing. Like, like you know, Arthur asks him, tell me a story of yourself that I would know you better. And Gowan's like, I have no story because yeah. he's not done anything. And then right about that time, this huge 
monstrous, surreal, you know, supernatural Green Knight comes in, issues a challenge. No one else stands up. Like all these other great knights, no one leaps to uh, to the challenge. And so Gowan is like, I'll do it. And um, and then there's in the in the film there's a wonderful moment where Arthur gives him Excalibur because he doesn't have a sword, and he gives him Excalibur. But, uh, but then as he gives it to him, he tells he he looks at him and he says, "Remember, this is only a game." And it's a warning that unfortunately goes unheeded because, again, the terms of the of the challenge are: if you cut me, then I cut you. And so, if he took it like that, then it's just a game, and you know, I take a swing at you, and then a year later, you take a swing at me, and hey, hey, it was fun. But because Gowan feels the need to prove himself, he goes all the way and cuts this guy's head off. Like, look at me, I'm this great champion. And but by doing that, he's basically doomed himself, right? Um, because this is a supernatural character and he's not dead. And now he, you know, you have a year to live basically. Um, and so, so it's actually a wonderful tale, sort of a cautionary tale about sort of youthful exuberance and wanting to prove yourself. And, you know, he wants so badly to have honor and to be, a, to be seen as a knight who's equal to these other knights. But, you know, that, that sort of grasping for greatness um, and there's a wonderful line in the film about this, about, you know, he wants to be great. And then someone says, what, good isn't enough? Like, you couldn't just be a good person? Um, yeah. Which is really interesting. Um, and I've got to say, I mean, it is, he, here's my, I'm just going to, I'm going to wrap it up. Because here, here's my thing about the film. I love this director. I was fascinated by this, by the visuals. The trailer it was very intriguing. So excited to see this film. Um, it was beautiful. It's beautifully shot. It's very surreal. These are things I love. They're very surreal, very uh, odd um, kind of, you know, uh, cinematography and things like this. And, but I've got to say overall, I want to say one more thing. I think it also makes the main point it wants to make about sort of life and death and youth and experience. And like it, it does a wonderful job, I think, of sort of nailing sort of the story point that it wanted to make. But having said all that, I really kind of came across disappointed. Um, I don't know if it's because my expectations were so high, but um, but when the credits were rolling at the end, I was just kind of like, yeah, no. I wanted to love it and I didn't. I, it was, I would say it's a good film. And if you're interested in any of those things I talked about, sure, go see it, um, but Overall, I want. I expected it to be, and this is ironic, right? I wanted it to be great, <laughs> and it wasn't great. It was just good. But for, <laughs> but for me, good wasn't enough. Um, I wanted it to be great. Uh, but anyway, I, I don't know. I, I hate, and I hate to give it a bad review. I think I was talking to somebody about the film in general on a, on a. I'm on a Facebook. I'm on a couple of Facebook uh, groups that talk about films, and I was sort of sharing this negative sort of negative review. And, um, and so a guy came on and he was like, yeah, I kind of agree with you um, for all the same reasons. And then, and then I said, but you know what? Here's what I want to say. I'm glad films like this exist. And I would prefer that more films like this get made than something, let's say, Fast and Furious 21 uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, the Disney Jungle Cruise movie. Like if they were, if we're going to make movies, can we make more like this? And even though it didn't completely satisfy me, I'm happy that a film like this got made. And I hope that this director continues to be given lots of money and lots of freedom to make more movies that are odd and quirky and surreal and strange like this. So yeah, that's, that's, my, uh, that's my review. Yeah. Uh, one thing with me is that I'm not someone where when I read a good book, I naturally think, oh, that was a great book. I hope they make it into a good movie because I always think of movies and books as having such different strengths and weaknesses. Yes. Um, I really just don't think that way. And there was a great poet who lives in Hawaii named W.S. Merwin. And a few years ago, he did a translation of, of the uh, Green Knight and it uh, reads really well and has a really interesting flow. And it was just so interesting about how it was about, um, layers of illusion being peeled away about how he goes on his journey. He stops in at a guy's house 
and then um, they have this other kind of contest where they say, let's go out in the day, and at the end of the day, I'll give you whatever I catch. And then the guy's wife is always making a play for him. So then that, um, on day one, he gives his host a kiss, doesn't tell him where he got it. On day two, he gives him a second kiss, then three kisses, but doesn't give in to this, uh, to this lady's wiles. And then um, when he meets the Green Knight, the Green Knight is basically like, yeah, this was a test. And you don't have to die because you passed the test. But I'm going to give you a little little scar here because um, you uh, failed the test in this minor way. And this was all put into play by Morgana Le Fay, actually. But um, you came through pretty well. And now he becomes a byword for courage, right? Yes. Um, so it's a great poem. And there was a great French poem in the 800s called The Song of Roland. And the Green Knight kind of has some things, like you can tell it's sort of influenced by that. And it just needs seeing this era when um, uh, society was not very um, literate, but they had these great stories that were passed um, uh orally by troubadours who would literally sing for their supper and pass around town yes. and then much later would get codified into this is the official version so um the green knight is a really inter like interesting window into like a different time and a different way of living that's for sure yes and by the way that that little scene that you just described about he meets he, he comes upon a house and the man says I'll give you anything I kill when I'm hunting during the day, but you give me anything that you find. Uh, and he goes, and, they, and he's like, well, what would I find in your house that isn't already yours? And the, and the man is like, oh, you'd be surprised or something. And that's exactly yeah. what happens. The wife is sort of coming on to him and he's feeling this tension. And that, that whole scene is not exactly the same, but that, that, that scene happens uh, in the film as well. So that's incorporated too. Yeah, it's um, it's again, it's an interesting film. I think if you were, I, I gotta say, I think for me, um, what I've realized, and I just couldn't help myself, but I know for me, expectation has a lot to do with how much, how how I perceive a film. If my expectations are super super high, the film will probably never live up to those expectations, and then I'm disappointed. So if I go into a film, let's, so in other words, I've watched movies that have gotten bad reviews. And people have hated it and I've kind of watched it almost I just had a morbid curiosity like how bad can this be and then guess what I'm like you know what that wasn't so bad I don't know you know what I mean it wasn't great but hey it sure. was pretty good well it's because my expectation was so low that it it succeeded it exceeded that and I'm like oh well that was pretty good so I, I know that with myself this kind of plays into my uh, my experience of a film um but I couldn't help myself. I even go, going into the green night, I was trying to lower my expectations, but I just couldn't do it. Huh. I just, I was, I had such high hopes for it. Um, but, uh, but you know, your, your difference, your mileage may vary as they say, you know, if you go into it sort of like listening to my review and expecting it's not going to be that great, but it's sort of mildly interesting. You might go and say, wow, that was like really cool. Uh, well, it's just funny that you say that he made ghost story because, uh, Ghost Story is obviously a great movie. And then, but you do watch and say, what could this guy possibly do for an encore? Like, right. what would his next movie be, right? Yes. Like, uh, um, that's such a great movie. And um, now, have you seen the movie? Because I think, are you thinking of the same movie I'm thinking of? That's the movie where, the, where like, the husband dies. Yes. You see yeah. that. And, and yeah. then he walks around in a sheet the whole time. Yeah, it's just a great movie. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's kind of funny because you know how Alfred Hitchcock said um, a bad movie is a film of people talking and a good movie is film of people thinking. Yeah. And both him and Orson Welles thought that in a good movie, you should be able to understand what's going on with the sound dog. And in Susan Kane, Orson Welles wanted you to be able to understand uh, what was going on in this scene just by the spatial relationships of the characters, like who's sitting up, who's standing, who's sitting down, who's standing up, who's in focus, who isn't. And it really makes you think about how much of communication is nonverbal, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, 
But then, of course, in most movies, most movies are garbage, where it's just people talking and telling you things you already know. Or like the Fast and the Furious, you're, you're like, talking about, where like, here's the plan, I'm going here, then I'll go there. <laughs> and it's just like nails on chalkboard. And then with the Ghost Story movie, there was a, so much information um, that was delivered without saying it. Yes. Because... Um, there's almost first no off, dialogue. You're, you, yeah, there's almost no dialogue in that film. It's almost all silent. Well, that you're just watching. Well, there's well, there's not a lot of dialogue because the guy's dead. Right. So <laughs> you really can't uh, do too much talking when you're dead. But the thing is, um, you're a human being and you've experienced a loss. So I don't have to tell you. You know, mm-hmm. like it's happened to you, right? You've experienced a loss. Yeah. Like you've had a death in the family. Yes. So. The wild thing is at the end of Ghost Story, when there is these bits where the ghost is just standing there while the world is changing around him. Yes. You know, and um, uh, um, they tear down an orchard to put up a condo. They yes. tear down the condo to put up a new condo. And again, that's real. That's something we've all experienced, yes. right? Being ravaged by the forces of time. Yes. And... Um, and the ghost is mute and immobile um, cause it, partially because he's a ghost and it's hard being a ghost, but also because that's how it is. Like, you know, um, you don't have the power to stop the real estate developers. Right. 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 This is happening, you know? Yes. Yeah. I, so, I, I, I love about that film too, how, how it shows that the ghost is, <laughs> sort of um, disconnected from time because he, 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 within a blink, he, he's like, he goes back to like a hundred years in the past when like where, where his house sits was an empty field. And there's like some guy with his wife and kids with a buckboard and he's cutting down a tree to build a log cabin in the, in the same spot, you know? And then it jumps forward like a hundred years in the future. And there's this massive high rise building and he's walking through the building that they, they're building. And again, in the same spot, but he's, uh, he's experiencing these jumps in time because for him, time doesn't mean anything. Um, there's even a beautiful scene in that movie where, well, when you watch the beginning of the film, um, before he dies, there's a scene where he and his wife are in bed at night and they hear like something falls and hits the piano. It's like a really yeah. loud sound. He's like, what the hell? And he grabs something and jump, runs outside, you know, in, into the living room thinking there's, you know, there's like a prowler and something, and he notices, oh, just something fell on the piano and that was weird. And he goes to bed. And then after he's dead, and I'm, this is a spoiler, I'm sorry. But the, after he's yes. dead, there's a scene where it, it repeats and it's, it's his own ghost. That his own ghost was able to go back in time to, as a spirit, before he died. And, and it was him being angry and hitting the piano that did that, made that sound. And you're like, yeah. whoa, this is so crazy. So like how, I don't know. It was just such so many beautiful little moments in the film. Uh, I really loved it. Like you said too, just how it's it's unspoken so much of the emotion and information. Yeah, it's great. Um, I was thinking about this quotation last week, and I don't have, have it quite memorized. But there was a there was a time when um, Albert Einstein had a friend who died, and then um, he wrote the widow a letter and said, um, uh, and uh, basically said. I hear that Basso, I hear that Besso has left a bit earlier than we have, but that is no matter. For people who believe in physics, we know the past of time is merely a stubbornly persistent delusion. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I guess Ghost Story is kind of like the end of, 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 of the book From Hell about Jack the Ripper. Yeah. Where in the last chapter of From Hell, Jack the Ripper dies, and then there's like a 30-page sequence, which is pretty fanciful of, you know, his soul leaving his body and all of that. And in that moment, um, he becomes kind of unstuck in time and sees visions of the past, the future, and um, uh, he actually prowls around um, uh, moments that for him are in the past. But the person in the past seeing his, you know, um, actually, there's one bit where he dies in 1890 or something and then goes back in time to see William Blake. 
and William Blake paints him. So, wow. so then as he's dying, just before his consciousness flickers out, he's like, oh, wow, that famous William Blake painting that I liked, he was painting me. Cool. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Very, very cool. Yeah. But yeah, Ghost Story, it kind of reminds me of another movie from a few years ago called Personal Shopper. Yes, I saw that. Uh, yeah. And um, I also thought that was pretty good. Um, I, you know, I, I, I like the idea um, of people making supernatural movies. And again, that's funny. Like, what's supernatural and what's natural, right? That's right. kind of like, like, just even those terms are kind of funny. Like, I live in the real world and there's weird stuff going on out there when, like, <laughs> you know, I think real world is pretty weird on a, on a good day, right? Right, exactly. So I do think it's kind of nice when people make a supernatural movie where they don't lay it on thick, Thank you. like, you know, uh, Vincent Price times with like shrieking and zooming in, but yeah. just play it flat. Yeah. And that's pretty interesting, right? And yeah, uh, I totally agree. I totally agree. I'm not a big horror film guy, but the things that I've watched that I've enjoyed are more things like Ghost Story or Personal Shopper, where it is just more, um, yeah, it's not, they don't amp it up to like it's everyone's in black and there's, you know, demonic possession and weird stuff going on. I mean, that that to me is like taking a little, I mean, that's been done and that's fine, but I got, that's not really what I'm into. But I love, well, the I thing love, about, no, go ahead. Uh, well, I mean, again, with personal shopper, it's like the trope of ghosts or supernatural stuff. What a great way to talk about a loss. Yes. And we all have that. And um, again, talking about a loss in, like, re like isn't exactly fun, but if you wrap it up in art and a good ride, then it's a way to get it in un uh, under the radar. So basically, like, you know, it's funny, like every society has, every, every culture has had ghosts, like believes in ghosts, right? It's a universal thing. Yes. So if ghosts aren't real, why would that be? And it's like, well, I have certainly had the experience of being so deranged by grief that I'll start to see someone on a corner where I saw them 10 years ago and they're not there, right? right. So it's not hard to imagine what's going on there. Right? So in personal uh, shopper, Kristen Stewart has had a loss and uh, um, she has some reason to think that the dead person is trying to contact her. And the movie has a great last line where you think it's building up to this big showdown or payoff or revelation. And then basically she says, is that you or is it only me? Right. Right. Yeah. And it's really sad because um, uh, um, on the one hand, like you're familiar with the book, A Lecture Lives Again by Frank Miller, right? Oh, gosh. Where, yeah, where um, the payoff is that basically here's a guy who whose lover died and now he's convinced that um, she's not really dead and I can, and if I solve this mystery, she'll be back to life and everything will be great and I'll get my happy ending. And then at the end, he finds out that she wasn't haunting him, he was haunting her and dead is dead, you gotta get over it. Yeah. And it's, and it's pretty spine tingling stuff. And then with the end of Personal Shopper, that last line, it's kind of like, oh wow, was my brother's poltergeist haunting me, or was it vice versa? Right. And it kind of makes it's kind of scary in the sense it makes you think, what is scarier, um, meeting a ghost or not meeting a ghost? Because what if her brother is really gone and she's stuck living here in a uh, materialistic universe? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I also love, to me, there's also a quantum connection as well that you alluded to earlier. This idea that <clears throat> our observation uh, of, of an object, you know, this is the quantum thing, right? You, you observing a particle changes the behavior of that particle, and we don't understand how that happens, but we do know it happens. There is this weird thing. And, and in, in a similar way, in Personal Shopper, this happens where she is so focused on, she is so desperate to see evidence that her brother is is his ghost is out there um well guess what the thing you're looking for is what you see like if you if you're looking for something that's like your 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 brain has has shifted 
you know, uh, to, to sort of like it's become a net to capture a certain butterfly. Well, guess what? If you do that, you're going to capture a lot of that kind of butterfly. If you, if you have shifted your focus to only see, it's what happens when, um, this is a very common thing, but like, you know, um, years ago, Wendy and I bought our first brand new car we ever bought was a Saturn. And uh, after we bought the Saturn, guess what? Every other car on the road was a Saturn. I just started, I saw Saturns everywhere. Did it, did it just so happen that right after I bought a Saturn, everybody else also bought a Saturn? No, there were always Saturns on the road. I just didn't pay attention to them because I wasn't looking for them, right? But it's all of a sudden, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that particular car because that's the car I'm driving and I see them everywhere. And it's the same kind of a thing. You know, I, I, I talked to someone years ago who said in our, in a house church setting. And she said, you know, my thing is, um, my gift, she said, my gift is I can, uh, I, I see everybody's sin. When I look at someone, I can just see their sin. And I was like, whoa. I said, well, look, here's the thing. If, if you are only looking for people's sins, I promise you, that's what you'll find. You'll see it. I promise you, because it's there. You'll see it. Um, but I said, here's the thing. What if instead of looking for people's sin, what if you instead looked for Christ in them? And then when you saw it, what if you said, oh my gosh, I just saw Christ in you. And then that would, if we all did that, what if we were all looking to see Christ in one another? And what we did, when we saw it, we called it out in one another. Like that would, in, that would spur us and inspire us to like, yes, I want to be more like that. Um, so I think it's, it's this principle of the thing you're looking for is what you'll find. Um, if you're looking for the ghost, guess what? You'll probably see it a lot. Like I've talked to people um, recently too, who've talked about, there was a time when they were really, really focused on demons and Satan was behind everything and any, anything that happened, oh, the devil's attacking me and there's a demon in my house, there's a ghost in my house, I need to cast demons out of my house and put holy water and pray in every room and blah, blah, blah. And then, then, but then they reached a point where they stopped believing in that. And guess what? They stopped having those experiences simply yeah. like because they don't believe that anymore. So now when they hear a little creak in the other room or something falls over because the wind blew it over, it's not a demon that did that. It's just so things that happen. Like it was just normal, right? And uh, so sometimes our filter depends on what we experience, right? If we're looking for it, that's what we'll experience. You know, um, FYI, that bit there when um, you said, here's the thing, that's really funny. And um, you should use that someday. So basically, <laughs> when you said you met a woman who had a secret power to detect secret sins, and you said, great, here's the thing. That's comedy gold. <laughs> I'll remember that if I ever do stand up. Yeah. yeah it kind of reminds me, there was one time a few years ago, I was at a party in, in Toronto and a woman started talking to me and she, and, uh, and I said to her, what's happening? And then she started telling me about how she was, uh, She'd been in a mental hospital, but she was misdiagnosed because they thought she had X, but really what the problem was, she was being possessed by a demon who was raping her in her sleep, right? So I wish I'd said, here's the thing, because that um, would have been funnier. So I said, okay, great. And then um, she started telling me about, um, she wasn't sure why it's so hard to find a good man and why she's still single. And then... I said, maybe if when you meet a man, you didn't talk about being raped by the devil in the first five minutes, that would increase your odds of finding your soulmate. Just write that down. Yeah. 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 See, save that for the second date. At least. Yeah. Whew. Oh, that's great. All right. Yeah. So um, I've taken us down a little road here. Uh, I know you had, you had a, a couple of poems you wanted to uh, share with us and talk and discuss. So, Except uh, now I don't have a good segue because we were talking about getting raped by the devil. So no, that um, poems about that. I hope. Yeah. So basically, um, uh, um, I'm sure in this podcast we'll will um, repeatedly be making the point that art is important and necessary and vital and crucial and all these good things in different ways. Um, but right now, I'm going to read a poem, and then you can take notes. 
And when I finish reading the poem, I will quiz you. Are you talking to me? Okay. Uh, sure, yeah. Okay, geez, I can take a note here, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight's streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the, mid the marriage hearse. So here, this is a poem by William Blake called London, and it's from 1794. And in this poem, he, William Blake is doing something that a billionaire or a CEO or a Kardashian cannot do. And that is giving a voice to the voiceless. Now, I don't know who was the mayor of London in 1794, who was the richest guy in town, but this poem is still here and it's still true and it still haunts. So what do you notice in this poem? Um, the word chartered is repeated in the first and second line. And in the hands of anybody else, they'd say, oh, you can't do that. That's a mistake. That's right. And you know the old cliche in writing, they say, you have to learn the rules before you can break them That's right. and all that. And like, yeah, assuming you've done your homework, um, you don't have to worry about the, about the rules that in, in that much, in, like in the same way as you do when you're starting out. Um, so one reason why Blake is so memorable is because he always breaks the rules. Right. And um, that is like, uh, like a ballsy move. It's a really mag or magisterial move of a guy saying, I'm telling the story. I'm going to tell it my way. Get out of my way. And um, it kind of reminds me, I was recently watching an interview with Orson Welles where they said, what makes Citizen Kane so great? Some tough question like that. And without hesitation, Orson said, ignorance. That's why. Um, and um, what he meant was that if he'd actually went to film school, film school would have taught him, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. That's crazy. That's not allowed. That's impossible. Right. But because he didn't know anything about film, it be, besides watching a lot of John Ford movies, and just being a smart guy, he's like, hey, want to try putting the camera there? Want to doing this? And because he wasn't a film student, he didn't have this voice in his ear saying, oh, no, 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 that's not class. You can't do that, right? And um, in the 21st century, movies aren't very good, in my opinion, compared to in the golden age. And a big reason why movies suck today is because of film school. Um, people go to film school and are told to do, a, to, to, to do things a certain way, so the end product looks a certain way. Um, also, um, going to film school costs money. So right there you're saying that only people with rich parents should be allowed to make movies. Um, uh, William Blake lived in poverty. He didn't have a lot of money and he has access to experience that people who have rich parents don't have. Right. right. So um, that's just kind of something I thought worth mentioning about what is wrong with movies today and, and the fact that film schools and the tuition costs reinforce a certain narrative, that's right. which is a real problem. So um, he says, I wandered through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow. And again, the word charter has kind of changed its meaning in the past 300 years, where um, basically um, uh, the word charter, it refers to mapping. And um, 
it also refers to uh, legal obligations like rent mm -hmm. and like and like we say chartered chartered accountant. But um, in his day, it um, saying chartered would have made people think of uh, taking a blank space and mapping it so it's not blank anymore, and also um, uh, contract law. Mm -hmm. So here he's basically saying that um, uh, his city is so um, every single thing and person is smothered in bureaucratic legalese could uh, uh, strictures. Um, it even applies to the to to the ancient river. Yes. Um, so even the ancient river Thames is choking and being smothered under this web of uh, legal obligations, legal strictures. Yeah. Is, um, it, is it um, would it be is it similar to the idea of saying that it's sort of quantified and monetized? But yeah, yeah, um, very much so. And of course, um, you know. Uh, William Blake was just sort of at the beginning of um, of the beginning of the industrial age, first seeing um, uh, the beginning of deforestation, the first smokestacks, these things in the name of efficiency. And he was very much like alarmed by that. And um, there's another great poet from Northampton, which is right in the middle of England named John Clare, who was always writing about um, trains coming to his town going through the forest and how alarming it was and um how um you know like obviously it's happening now but it was happening back then about um the intense like the huge biodiversity that people in london would have experienced and now you know if you, if you get rid of a forest like so much is lost so it's a it's uh, pretty wild, like the way Blake and Claire write about smokestacks, um, which for us, we can say, oh, I don't like pollution, but we don't have the same sense of horror as they do about it. Right. So that's pretty interesting. And um, then he says, and Mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. So he used the word mark three times in two lines. Mm -hmm. First as a verb. And then as a noun, like uh, in Shakespeare's day, the word character, what's the word character mean? To Shakespeare, it meant to write something down. And that meaning is kind of carried over when we say uh, characterize yeah. means to describe something. Yes. So here it uses the word mark first as a verb, first as a noun, which is pretty cool. And... Um, then he describes um, this human misery and um, says and mentions mind for mind forged manacles, and um, there he's kind of saying that um, the toughest prison to break out of is the one that is self-imposed. Yeah. And um, J. G. Ballard once said, "The walls of your prison are the sutures of your own skull." Wow. Yeah. So, good. so uh, when he says that, and when um, William Blake says um, to mark the mind forged manacles, he's basically saying, like what you were saying about demons, like, are you oppressed by this external or are you, are you oppressed by your own thoughts? Exactly. And something can, internal inside of you. Yes. Yeah. So um, right there, that's worth your price of admission right there. Mark the mind forward manacles. Yes. Um, you know, it's hard work to do. And, um, you know, uh, and obviously humans would prefer to uh, point their fingers outside, say, you're the problem. You're the source of my problems. Um, so it's just funny about how, um, you know, and like Blake was funny, but like by our standards, he lived in, the most crushing poverty you can imagine, but um, 
he was a model husband and I was laughing and having a good time because of, of uh, what he believed. Right. And um, he believed in demons a thousand percent. And um, he thought that um, the air in the room around him was packed shoulder to shoulder with uh, angels and devils and spirits that he could see and talk to. Right. So um, his material poverty really couldn't get under his skin in the same way when you have that uh, belief, right? Yeah. So then it says in chapter three, how the chimney sweeps cry, every blackening church appalls. So that's kind of funny where um, uh, a church a, the walls of a church get sullied with soot and they don't like that. But the funny thing is the chimney sweep would have been a young child about four because kids were small enough to go up in the chimney. Yikes. So it's funny. People think of chimney sweeps as in Mary Poppins with Dick, Dick Van Dyke. Dyke. Yeah. They, they're really good dancers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's actually not true. Um, chimney sweeping is about uh, child slave labor. Yeah, they were kids. Yeah, yeah. So um, when he says, how the chimney sweepers cry, every blackened church appalls, he's basically saying, um, yeah, yeah, it's real sad that there's soot on your stained glass windows, but if the church was doing its job, maybe these kids wouldn't be uh, climbing up these chimneys. Yeah, being and, lowered and, uh, <laughs> down the chimneys, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's, um, so, so again, there's some pretty good uh critique of the church that manages to sneak in under the wire because of rhythm and meter and just being uh, pleasing to the ear. Yeah. And then he says, and the hapless soldiers cry runs in blood down palace walls. So again, um, a soldier's blood spatters the King's palace. Yes. And Oh no, you know, don't mess with the King's palace. But again, um, uh, who spills their blood in wars? Is right. it, is it the, the uh, king's children or the people who have um, the least amount to gain from the victory? Yeah. And what's interesting about that line, too, I guess both, both of those lines, is that he says that, and in a way it's true, but in another way it isn't true. In other words, if I, go and, if I went and looked at the king's palace, I wouldn't see the blood of soldiers spattered on the walls or running down the walls. But so in other words, it's, it's not obvious to everybody. It isn't there for all to see, um, but it's still true. It's sort of a metaphor, right, to say, but in a way, yes, it is, all right? And, they, and he's saying, I see it. When I, when I look at the palace, that's what I see. Or when he looks at the church and he sees, you know, the blackening, uh, you know, the blackening church, he can't help but think about, he, in other words, he, he looks at the blackening church and he doesn't go, ah, that sucks. Let's fix up, let's paint up the church. No, when he sees the blackening church, he thinks of these children that are being oppressed as chimney sweeps. And, and when he looks at the palace he did, and he sees, you know, if he saw blood on the palace, he doesn't say, oh, let's clean that off. That's so sad. Let's make it beautiful. It's like, no, <laughs> uh, I see this blood. He, when he looks at the palace, he sees the blood of these soldiers, right? He, all they can do is sigh. Like there's this helplessness. So he even says the hapless soldiers. So I love that. I love that uh, the way he expresses both of those ideas uh, in those stanzas. That's really beautiful. See, and uh, that's art. That is art doing something that you can't do in any other way. Right. right? Like um, no one likes hearing sermons or being, or getting the impression someone is trying to sell you something. Yes. But if you wrap it in art, then you can sneak this in under the radar, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, maybe Buckingham Palace isn't literally dripping blood, but if you're perceptive like Blake was and, and you have this imagination and a conscience, you know, he's saying, yeah, that's what I see. Don't you see it? You're blind. You're the weirdo, not me. You know, you should see this, right? Right. And um it's kind of funny, like the great novelist Honoré de Balzac from France, he said, um, every fortune is built upon a forgotten crime. Mm -hmm. So um, in mind of that, like, let's say you look at the White House, right? Do you look at and do you look at the White House and say, oh, wow, nice marble. I love marble. That's a lot of marble. 
you know, or someone like William Blake might think of uh, predator drone strikes right. um, and what they have done to uh, families in Yemen. Yes. Right. Yes. But if you're just a tourist, you go, nice marble. It's, <laughs> of, it's real shiny. I like That's shiny right. things. Yes. Quality stonework here. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so then um, he sees these things where, again, it's like, um, if it wasn't for art, this would be like Abraham Simpson yelling at a cloud or some letter to the editor, right? About these things here. I love it. <laughs> but because, um, but but because of art, right? You can scratch on the edge. You can't scratch any, any other way. And the funny thing, is, if you read the collective works of William Blake, it's like, oh wow, this page is gibberish, gibberish, gibberish. Oh wow, that's genius, gibberish, gibberish. Oh wow, and. Um, a lot of his output was kind of for his own benefit in the sense like dictating conversations he had with, uh, with uh, demons and invisible spirits yeah. where I'm like, yeah, yeah, there's not a lot of room for me to get in here because, you know, I don't speak this language. Yes. So he'll have stuff which is pretty much close to being written in a private language. And then once in a while, he will have poems like London, which are some of the best poems ever but written with the vocabulary of an eight-year-old. Yeah. Because um, it's not about showing off your vocabulary, it's about communicating something that's true and important and urgent. Right. So uh, London is very much a high watermark in uh, the history of English poetry, and uh, there's nothing fancy about it, because it's about communication, you know? Yes. Yeah, I, I, so then I love that. He shows, he, he shows you all these sites, and then says, but most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse bless the newborn infant's ear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. So here the poem ends, but um, it doesn't end. The miserable cycle starts again yeah. with a child being born into poverty amid uh, curses and disease. Yes. So... Um, it's just funny about how it's very much uh, a uh, an autopsy, a diagnosis of London, and a call to action. And also, um, with the ending, that shows this whole thing is a cycle that is now going to restart. It's like, you think the poem's over, but for the people inside the poem, it's not over. It's going to go on and on. Yeah. He's actually saying um, uh, to look at systemic causes instead of the conventional wisdom of um, if you're poor it's because of a moral failing if you're poor it's because you deserve it yeah uh god's punishing you right uh or else um you're lazy like um like i pulled like i did okay why can't you it must be right. a, and um so here he's actually pointing out not uh that these that these that these snippets of individual human suffering actually have systemic causes, and it's going to take more than just finger pointing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's what's so wonderful too about how art has the power to provoke us, like you said, a call to action. Now, there's a quote. Um, you know what? I can't remember who said it. I'll, I'll look it up maybe and I'll, I'll try to share the exact quote and maybe in our next episode. But um, um, someone had said that, uh, and I think I read this in, there, there's a magazine called Image Journal. It's actually a, uh, it's a Christian funded uh, arts journal, but it's not cheesy. It's like actual art, you know what I mean? Like the kind of stuff you and I are talking about. And um, it, was a, it was a quote from something I had read in Image Journal several years ago, probably 20 years ago. And it was about how um, whoever, whoever had said it, said that um, the role of art is like, similar to the ancient prophets, like Jeremiah and Isaiah, um, not to foretell the future, but to provoke and um, to sort of call out the injustices in our world and to provoke us to, to action. And that, and, uh, Again, I can't remember exactly who said it, but that, it was something along the lines of how 
the 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 goal of art or the, the the purpose of art is to it's not just to be an adornment it's not just to be pretty um, you know this is very shallow levels of art it, the true art really if it if it does its job it's it's a prophetic voice to our culture to our society to our neighbors right it, it, true art is is the kind that would provoke us to action. I don't know if you've heard that before. If you are, what do you think about that kind of a that kind of an idea? Well, it's well, it's funny. You mentioned prophecy, and if I did my rant on prophecy, we should probably save that for a future episode. Okay, I'll write that Cause, down. Because, <laughs> yeah, because because it would take a while, and it's very much true that um, it's funny. Uh, prophecy does not mean fortune telling. Right. And uh, and Moses actually said uh, in his Deuteronomy, I think it was. Uh, if you got a fortune teller, kill him. Right. Right. Because uh, that's not cool, right? And um, uh, first off, the word um, uh, navi in Hebrew, which meant prophet, it, it meant different things in different centuries. And it was one point when it meant a person who uh, went into a religious trance. And there's a part when King Saul has what you might has what a person in 2021 might call an epileptic seizure, and he falls to the ground, starts twitching, and people make fun of him by saying, uh, "Has he joined the guild of the prophets? Is That's he a right. son of the prophets?" Yes, because prophets are supposed to fall to the ground, go into a trance. So it's so they're kind of mocking him, but um, but but uh, the real prophets are very much about critiquing the present moment. Yes, and. It's kind of funny, like, um, the, like the prophets would see a society that is um, in the decadent stage, and then they say, this isn't going to last, and then things fall, fall apart, and then later people are like, my God, he could tell the future. And like, no, he was just not an idiot, you know, because <laughs> societies have these life cycles, and... Um, uh, it's in your best, you know, when a prophet comes to town, it's in your best interest to listen, that's for sure. But Yes. Yeah, and see, I think that modern day <clears throat> prophet, I mean, so I'll just say this and then let's, let's, let's do something in the, in the future because I think that we, you and I can both see a whole lot more about this topic. But um, I, I've, I've lately started to wonder if the true modern prophet today isn't, isn't seen as such. Like, you wouldn't you wouldn't look at some people who I think are really doing the work the work of a prophet, and you wouldn't call them a prophet. But you might call them a comedian, or you might call them an artist. You might call them a poet. You know what I mean? Like I I think because again, it isn't about telling the future. It's really about the present. It's a critique of the present moment. It's a it's a um, sort of a warning about our present moment and what it could become if we if we don't respond. And this again, this is why. I, one of the things I love about science fiction, because I think to me, what I would list as my all-time favorite science fiction uh, novels are novels that are are doing that. Um, they're 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 extrapolating something that's happening in their present and saying this could be our future. Um, so yeah, I think it's people that it's basically it's just people I think who uh, are paying attention. Uh, they're noticing things that are going on, similar to Blake. All right, here, here we talk about Blake, where as he's walking down the streets of London uh, and he's noticing these things, he's noticing things other people don't notice. And by him expressing the things that he notices that everyone should notice, uh, it's the opportunity for them to have eyes to see things that they haven't seen. Uh, and I think that's such a, that's, we need this, all right? We, we individually need this, and we as a, a culture and a society we need these kinds of prophets among us, whether they're um, doing it with comedy, they're doing it with poetry, they're doing it with film, they're doing it with a novel. However, however it comes to us, we have to be aware of that. Yeah, um, it does make you wonder, like, how to, uh, like, how to, like, how to deliver a message in a way that will be effective and be clear like certainly like you mentioned like uh comedians and the hebrew prophets in the bible they 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 had a lot of comedy like uh micah had a lot of jokes and puns 
and uh, different and uh, different ways of getting under people's skin. Yeah. And um, like with time, you look back and you read William Blake and think, oh, wow, he was the smartest guy in town in 1792. He was right in the money. But in that year, people just thought he was like an actual crackpot. Right. Uh, wasting his life at stuff that didn't matter. Yes. And um, certainly in our time, that's even more ramped up with improvements in technology where um, the powers that want to stifle an individual point of view, an eccentric point of view, and a point of view that can't be uh, packaged that easily, it's overwhelming, you know, like... Um, like, how do you fight against the Fast and Furious Part 20 or something? Right. <laughs> like, Don't where do you begin? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. Now boycott. Let's boycott. That's yeah. Yeah. Well, did you want to, um, we're, we're, we've come up on an hour, so I don't know. Do you want to cover your other poem? I don't know. Um. Does a podcast have rules? <laughs> Only, well, you know, it's our podcast, man. We can do whatever we like. Um, okay, fine. Um, I hope this works. Um, okay, so basically, we are going to travel forward in time through the magic of art, a time machine. We're going to go from the year 1794 to uh, 1994, 200 years in the blink of an eye. Whoa. Yeah. Now, there was a great American poet who died in 2015 named Philip Levine, and he was a great one. He was uh, the Poet Laureate of America, I think, twice, and um, he was great. And um, he has a famous poem called What Work Is, and um, this is a poem that has been widely anthologized, uh, read by all sorts of people. Um, new generations of young people have read this, and found something meaningful in it, which was very inspiring to him. So basically, he was from Detroit, and he uh, wrote very much from a, with a, uh, uh, from a, about a blue collar working class world, because that was the world he knew. Yeah. And again, it's like, um, you know, people go see Fast and the Furious because they like looking at very attractive multimillionaires. That's their thing, I guess. And they don't want to hear stories about uh, blue collar people and that's their choice. Right. But um, Philip Levine was like Chekhov in the sense that he could document a different side of life that hadn't been given a voice before. It's like I think I said last time of all the great Russian writers, um, uh, Anton Chekhov was the only one out of the, out of the whole bunch who was not, an aristocrat, um, where his dad had a pharmacy at one point, went real shifty, and um, all the other uh, great great ones were pretty well to do with uh, live-in servants. Yeah. So they could tell about generals and colonels, but they couldn't talk about blue-collar people. Right. Yeah. So anyhow, this is a poem. This is a great poem called. Uh, what work is, uh, and it's cool. Um, you'll see that the style is very different than Blake's. It has some things in common with it, but it has some things that are different. And this would get back to a conversation about style, which we should have at some point too. So this is a poem, What Work Is by Philip Levine. We stand in the rain in a long line, waiting, at Ford Highland Park for work. You know what work is. If you're old enough to read this, you know what work is, although you may not do it. Forget you. This is about waiting, shifting from one foot to another, feeling the light rain falling like mist into your hair, blurring your vision, until you think you see your own brother ahead of you, maybe 10 places. You rub your glasses with your fingers, and of course, it's someone else's brother, narrower across their shoulders than yours, 
but with the same sad slouch, the grin that does not hide the stubbornness, the sad refusal to give in to rain, to the hours wasted waiting, to the knowledge that somewhere ahead, a man is waiting who will say, no, we're not hiring today for any reason he wants. You love your brother. Now suddenly, you can hardly stand the love flooding you for your brother who is not beside you or behind or ahead because he's home trying to sleep, sleep off a miserable night shift at Cadillac so he can get up before noon to study his German. Works eight hours a night so he can sing Wagner, the opera you hate most, the worst music ever invented. How long has it been since you told him you loved him? Held his wide shoulders, opened your eyes wide and said those words and maybe kissed his cheek. You've never done something so simple, so obvious, not because you're too young or too dumb, not because you're jealous or even mean or incapable of crying in the presence of another man. No, just because you don't know what work is. Mm. Damn. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah, I don't think I've ever heard this one before. This is really wonderful. What a great poem. I love, um, you know, you talk a little bit about the rules of poetry. and um, What I love is <clears throat> when, he, when he sort of, uh, if you think of it as a camera lens, when he's focusing in on these specific details, shifting from one foot to another, I mean, that is exactly what you would do if you were actually standing in a long line for hours, right? That whole shifting, and I've done that. We've all, we've all done that. We've all stood in a long, long line, whatever it was for. And you do get to that place where it's like, you're tired of standing on your right foot and you shift to the other one. That's such a simple thing, but it's so real. And it, those kinds of details pull you in. Um, and I love how it shifts almost right at the first third of it from being about standing in a line, waiting for work to being about his brother. And then it sort of becomes, you know, he mingles these ideas together. It's really wonderful. Yeah, that's beautiful. You know, one thing it has in common with William Blake's London, just to back up for a minute, you'll yeah. notice in the poem, uh, London, William Blake's narrator is wandering through town, but he never meets anyone. And what he encounters instead is their residue mm. and signs that humans have been there and some sound. Yeah. But he never is able to connect with another person. And uh, this, this wanderer s stays lonely. And an actual individual is nowhere to be found. He sees uh, soot. He sees machinery. But he can't connect with a person. And uh, in Philip Levine's poem, What Work Is, you notice the same thing, where notice that from the beginning of the poem to the end, he doesn't move. Yeah. And uh, Henry Ford has robbed him of his agency. Right. And um, Philip Levine actually worked for Cadillac for about a day before he got fired. And um, Philip Levine referred to the surf test, like S-E-R-F, not like uh, not. the uh, Ventures, Dick Dale. Yeah. <laughs> and the surf test meant the, uh, the uh, executives at uh, Cadillac um, would look out their window in the rain and they'd see these, this army of men and they'd say, if you are so desperate and so beaten down by the American dream that you're willing to stand in the rain for eight hours, 
for the possibility of maybe getting a job interview, um, you've probably been you, hammered down enough that you won't give us any problems and you'd probably fit in here pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the surf test was to make sure that you had the right stuff where by the time you got to the point where you were willing to stand in, in the rain for all day, um, you probably weren't going to give the foreman any trouble. Yes. Be because um, you'd already been ground down by desperation that that, that like that was all over. Yeah. Uh, I, I like, I like the, how you use the phrase, you have the right stuff. But it's sort of like how that system has redefined the right stuff, right? Because I think of the right stuff as, you know, there's that movie, and I think there's a book as well about, you know, the the uh, first Apollo astronauts and, uh, you know, John Glenn and these guys were test pilots, and the whole thing was they had the right stuff. And what do they mean? Well, they had this inner, you know, drive, and uh, they didn't fear death, and, you um, you know, there, you know, there's all these amazing things that, man, they had this amazing, this, these noble qualities about them that made them separate from everybody else and made them heroic and, and uh, noble. And, um, but in the system we're describing, uh, you know, the, the things that Levine went through and I've gone through, I think anybody that's worked uh, has gone through, okay. is the right stuff is redefined as you'll, you'll take the crap uh, because you're so desperate for a job um, that even if I gave you a job that was just barely enough for you to scrape by, if you just ate yeah. ramen every meal, you would snatch it up in a heartbeat and you would, you would be terrified of losing that job and you'd do anything I told you to do. Like that now, that's the right stuff. But, but what, look what we've done to the human soul, to the human spirit, to redefine the right stuff as your, your innate ability to, to be crapped on and uh, put up with it. Yeah, that's why I think as far as profits go, Philip Philip Levine is a pretty uh, good one. And also you'll notice at the start of the poem, he says, you know what work is. If you can read this, you know what work is. And then the last line of the poem is, all this happened because you don't know what work is. Yes. And um, that's a pretty good prophetic critique right there. Basically, when he says... Um, if you can read this, you know what work is. It's actually kind of mockery mm -hmm. in the sense that in our world, um, we really prioritize like uh, certain kinds of technical knowledge that can be admired, transferred into a higher hourly wage and all these things. And uh, we know, you know, and like that's the kind of knowledge we we value like you can uh, like you can acquire some new skills you can be in a higher income bracket and yeah. way to go that's cool right yeah but then um it turns out this guy who um we're on his side because you know he's been beaten down by the american dream so much but then it turns out hey wait a minute you've never told your brother you love him what's the matter with you right what the hell's the matter with you you don't know what work is. Yeah. So so he's kind of saying like our real project isn't to um, increase our income so we can get a lot of stuff and build a fence around our stuff, but to learn how to uh, love your brother. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And okay. it's kind of funny, like love is also a kind of work where you know how um, there are people who get married and then they get divorced and they say, oh, wow, um, I, uh, I thought this would be like in the movies where it's just like Ferris wheels and roller coaster rides. Yep. But, um, but this is different, so I'm out of here, right? Yeah, because it's work. Because they don't know what work is. They don't want to do the work, right? That's right. But when you love someone, it's like, wait a minute, you mean you want me to uh, – adapt my whole existence to the rhythms of this other soul that I don't begin to understand. That's, that's crazy. Why would I do that? Right. Yeah. You know, you don't know what work is. Right. Yeah. And you know, there's a, that's a fascinating thing too, because you could also take it in the sense of um, how, you know, you're willing to stand in line for eight hours in the rain. 
uh, in a line that isn't moving, knowing that there's a great chance when you get up there, the foreman's going to say, sorry, no work today. And, um, and so you're willing to do that kind of work or you're going to do that kind of, it'll suffer, endure those kinds of things for what you know is probably going to be no payoff. And yet you won't do the kind of work that would be grabbing your brother by the shoulders, looking him in the eye, telling him that you love him, giving him a kiss on the cheek. Like, okay, that might be difficult to do too, but there's way more payoff in that. <laughs> That's worth way more than, than this job that you're probably not going to get. And when you do get it, it's going to be a crappy job. And um, so that, I love that. I love kind of like comparing these two things together. Like, what are you willing to do? Uh, you know, and, and it's sort of like challenging this idea. Like, if you're willing to go to do these kinds of things and even to say, in some, in some sense, like, I'm proud of that. Like this whole work ethic, right? There, there's, there's some yeah, yeah, yeah. work ethic where like, you're willing to work extra hours and stay late and do all these things, you know, because that, that you know, um, this is what it means to be a good human being. Um, but you're not willing to put the same amount of effort into relationships with people like your own brother or your marriage or things like that. Like, like you know, to, to, to kind of like point out that disconnect. I think that's really important. Yeah, and again, I guess this will be a recurring theme with our podcast, but again, this is another great example of uh, the power of art and um, what art can do that nothing else can do and why it's so important, right? right? So we should really be grateful for art and celebrate it whenever we can. And here, in this, here, you're basically saying art is a way of forcing you to... Uh, ask yourself, what do you value? What is really important? Do, does, does, does my hierarchy of values need to be reappraised? Am I out to lunch here? Am I living in touch with reality or am I just, you know, going along with this insane flow, right? Yeah. yeah. Where on the one hand, also the thing is, um, one thing you notice about a society like ours where the brainwashing is so powerful, um, uh, when a pathology becomes universal, the universality makes it go invisible. Yes. So basically in the 1940s, there was a horror movie from Britain called Peeping Tom. And it was a horror movie. And the horror was that there was a guy who liked looking at scantily clad ladies he wasn't married to, right? And that was their idea of a horror movie. And now, thanks to improvements in technology, everyone is a peeping Tom. Right. Right? 90% of the times when a person turns on a laptop, it's for a certain reason. Yeah. Okay? So now, being a peeping Tom isn't, isn't horrifying anymore because everyone's a peeping Tom. Right. So by going universal, this pathology turned invisible. And it's the same thing with, uh, with uh, what work is, where um, it's normal to uh, avoid your loved ones by working overtime. Yes. Right? Um, and then, you know, your gross income goes up, so who am I to knock it, right? Right. So... Uh, when you read great art, like What Work Is by Philip Levine, then you almost might have this little Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder moment when you say, hey, hey, I know it feels normal, but what if, even though it feels normal, it's crazy? <laughs> right. Right. And you're right. See, that is the beauty of art. I love, and we've used this phrase a couple of times. This under the radar sense of, uh, and so in so many ways, I think it's because we have a certain pathology. That's a, I think that's a great terminology. There's a certain pathology in our society where it becomes invisible. It becomes something where this is we just call it normal now. Um, you need these voices. You need another way. You, I think here's the thing about art. I think art has the power to show you the world you're seeing already, but you're, but you're missing it. There's this invisible thing to you. So art has a way of showing you the thing that you can't see. It's right in front of you, but you can't see it because of the pathology. 
and it has a way of re reformatting it, right? Let, if I paint it this way, if I tell it this way, if I put it into a song, if I if I take it away from your context and I let's put it into the future, imagine a world where this crazy thing happened, right? Like when you can do that, art allows you to see the thing that you that you're not seeing. I, I mean, I think that's one one thing I could say about it. I think what I love about good art, it has the ability to help you see the thing that you're ignoring or that's invisible to you by putting it in a different context, expressing it in a different way. And it becomes this subversive a way of communicating a very important truth that you're either ignoring or that you're, in some ways, you're blind to. Oh, yeah. What can I say to that? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah. uh, we've gone for about an hour and a half. This has been a blast. I think we probably should uh, consider wrapping it up. And this is our first one. So everything's new to us. Like, well, how do we how do we start? I don't know. How do we transition? I don't know. How do we end? I've, yeah. What's a podcast? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But um, I do wanted to make sure that I mentioned, um, in addition to being somebody who's really smart and uh, very knowledgeable about many things, my friend Daryl Epp is also uh, a published poet and um, he has some great poetry. His most recent book is Mechanical Monkeys, but he's got, you have what, like four or five uh, books of poetry? Um, basically, it, um... I'm hoping the fifth one comes out next year. Um, so uh, right now, as, as far as that goes, it's four, yeah. Okay. And um, <clears throat> he has um, he's making available to you wonderful people, signed copies of his books through the mail. So uh, the, way you could, uh, the way you could do that, you get one of those and support him, is uh, send $20 via PayPal to, and is this it? Pay, no, not PayPal, paypay.me slash Daryl Epp. Is that no, right? it's PayPal. Oh, it is PayPal. Pay yeah, maybe that's a typo, but it's paypal.me slash Daryl Epp. Yeah. Paypal.me. Okay. Yeah. Paypal.me slash Daryl Epp. I'll, I'll drop the link into the comments as well. Um, and then he'd be happy to mail out signed copies of Mechanical Monkeys and Sinner's Dance for your listening or reading pleasure. Yeah, and, and if they have any questions, they could just find me on Twitter and ask me. Or yeah. yeah, and I've said before, I'll say it again. Uh, I really enjoy your Twitter feed. You, uh, in fact, you and I had a great conversation the other day about, uh, I think, Jack Kirby and, oh, and I, I brought up uh, Roger McGinnis, who I, I really love his art. Oh, yeah, great, great. I bought, in, I bought a, a large collection of his illustrations. Just a fun, I know he's still alive. You know, that guy's not- That's he's crazy. Still, he's still yeah. producing art. He's incredible. Uh, but he painted just like you said, hundreds of um, pulp covers back in the 50s and 60s and continues to do amazing art. He's just a phenomenal painter um, and illustrator. Love that guy's work. And so anyway, on your Twitter feed, you're all you're constantly sharing really interesting stuff, uh, art and poetry and ideas and things like that. And really, I find it very entertaining and very uh, inspiring. So check out, check out Daryl's Twitter feed. And uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter too, by the way, if you want to follow me on Twitter and I'm on Facebook and Instagram as well. I've got some books too. They're on Amazon. You'll find them. Uh, dink around. You'll see them there. Thank you guys for watching and or listening to our uh, first episode of Imaginary Lines podcast. And uh, we'll do it again sometime soon. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Take care.